My name is Rocky Patel. I'm the president and CEO of Rocky Patel Premium Cigars. I think the first cigar I smoked um, was actually with this playmate at the Grand Havana Room called India Allen. She was on the cover of Cigar Aficionado and uh, that was the first time I smoked a cigar was with her. But then slowly I started smoking cigars and then we joined at the Grand Havana Room because Grand Havana Room opened up and we'd go there and it was next to my office in Beverly Drive and we'd go there after work. I was one of the original members. And all of a sudden cigars blew up and became a big thing. And I was relaxing there and I got approached by um, a gentleman by the name of Phil Zangi. And uh, Phil was uh, a really vivacious, fun, crazy, uh, funny individual. And um, Phil uh, asked me, you know, he goes, listen, I, I started a company called Indian Tobacco, I'm making cigars out of Honduras, blah, 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 blah. And, uh, you know, um, I need some investors and, you know, and he convinced me that, you know, this would be a project and he had the rights to Indian Motorcycle Company and they had a license to Indian Motorcycle because I was like, what's with Indian Tobacco? And his dad actually used to own Indian Motorcycle at one point and that's how it all started. And so uh, I invested in the company and I knew nothing about cigars, knew nothing about tobacco, knew nothing about how to make them. You know, that we, we ended up going to our first show in um, Cincinnati. That show, I remember people coming to us with like $10,000 in cash in a suitcase, $20,000 in cash here, send us whatever you can, here's the cash. I said, this is like selling crack. I mean, this is like unbelievable. I, people are lined up, not knowing anything about our cigars, just willing to pay us all this money to just send them cigars, just make them and send them, just send them, send them. And uh, I was shocked and I didn't realize that there was such a back order for cigars. The boom was so strong that there was a marketplace that was just looking to buy anything and everything. And you know, and I started understanding the market a little more and I started understanding a little more and you know, and this was supposed to be a hobby. So while all this was going on, all of a sudden Indian Motorcycle Company went into bankruptcy. And when they went into bankruptcy, the receiver from uh, Denver, Colorado called me and I still re remember his face, can't remember his name right now, but he called me up and said, um, you know, you don't have a license with us. I said, what do you mean we don't have a license? I said, my partner Phil Zangi has a license and you know, his dad used to own the company and while we investigated this a little further and of course there was no licenses. So we ended up having to settle with Indian Motorcycle for around a quarter million dollars or some ridiculous amount. So now this hobby that I got into for fun turned into something very, very serious and I was getting sucked into this at the same time we were sending all this money down to Honduras and you know, we, we, we had people making cigars for us down there that I'm not necessarily sure we trusted and who knows what was going on and the financial scheme of it all didn't make any sense we, compared to the invoices and the pricing and it was just very, very shady what was going down in Honduras. And I would call down there to Phil and he goes, oh, you can't come down here, it's dangerous. You know, we're all here with automatic rifles and AK-47s and every time I go to the farm, I'm driving around with guns pointed outside the window and I got my buddy Gabriel and he's got shotguns and rifles and we were armed with, you know, and, and it's crazy, we can't even pay the farmers when we get there to the farms because we don't know if we're going to get robbed in the middle of the night. And you know, So I said, well, I, I got to go see what's going on. But I'm just bleeding money here. So he made it sound like an absolute war zone. So I went down there finally and, and you know, it was pretty bad. I mean, it was, uh, you know, the Sandinistas and the Contras had just finished fighting and there were landmines everywhere and it was you know everybody had a weapon on them wherever you went the first day they picked me up at the airport you know I get to the hotel in Tegucigalpa which is the capital we're staying there they're like don't go out at night and you know and uh, as I lean over the balcony to see our buddy Gabriel driving away he opens up the sunroof and just lets like six rounds go in the air like, ta -ta 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 -ta. I go holy cow this is like the you know this is like being in, in, a, in an old western, you know. It was quite dangerous, it was quite bad. And, 
And then I started learning a little bit about tobacco. I started learning about the factories. I met with the Lou Rothman. I met with Nestor Placencia. I met with a lot of people, visited a lot of factories, see what people are doing right, what people are doing wrong, learning about curing, about fermentation, you know, learning about blending. So we made all these great blends and all these great cigars. And they got some good ratings, the 92 ratings and 93 ratings and stuff like that. But the problem was that they were always inconsistent. So, you know, every time I'd go to a store and we'd do an event, we'd sell boxes. But then when I left, you couldn't sell because, you know, being that it was the boom or towards the end of the boom, a lot of the people that we were working with at the time were taking shortcuts and they weren't curing the tobacco enough, they weren't fermenting the tobacco enough, they would substitute the wrapper, they would substitute the binder, they would substitute a filler. So I'd get shipments and then they'd be very inconsistent from cigar to cigar, from box to box, from blend to blend. You know, there were times where I almost wanted to cry because I'd get a shipment in and I'd open the box and look at the color of the wrapper, I'd look at the spots on the wrapper, I'd taste the cigar. They were so inconsistent, they were so young, they were just so nothing like the blends we made. And we trusted everybody down there, you know. My deal was I shake your hand, we gave you the money, we gave you deposit, make the cigars. I was expecting the blends that we made or the blends that would come up and that never happened. And so I finally went and talked to the Placencia family and I knew that they were one of the biggest growers of Cuban seed tobacco in the world. And I said to them, if you listen to the way we want to operate, the way I want to operate, the way we're going to make cigars, I promise you that the Placencia name and you know, our name together um, you know, will be well known in the marketplace. And in order to do that, there are a number of things we have to do. I said, first of all, we have to spend a lot of time in making sure we sort the tobacco properly by priming. So instead of Lijero Viso and Seiko, we have to actually take the tobaccos and break it down into more defined characteristics called priming. So every time we make a cigar, it's not just Viso, it's not just Seiko, it's not just Lijero. We're going to take the seventh priming from a particular farm in Hamastran, Honduras. We're going to take the sixth priming from a particular farm in Esteli, Nicaragua. We're going to take a fifth priming from a particular farm in Costa Rica. This way, every cigar has the same leaf from the same plant from the same curing, the same fermentation, from box to box, cigar to cigar, to have consistency. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to make sure we spend the most time pushing the tobacco in the fermentation process so that all that rich fertilizer it has, the nitrogen, the boron, the potassium, the magnesium that it absorbed to make the plant nice and strong, we have to bleed it and it takes two years, three years, four years. The higher the priming, the thicker the tobacco, the more fertilizer it's holding, the more time it's need to ferment that tobacco. We're going to take the time to really age the tobacco, cure it, ferment it, and then we're going to change our construction habits of how we construct the cigar. We're going to slow down the bunchers. There's going to be a particular way they bunch the cigar. We're going to take, make sure they get the best materials that are aged, and we're going to draw test every single cigar to make sure the draw is perfect. That's what's going to, going to ensure the quality. So right about the time we were getting ready to do that, there was a company called U.S. Tobacco, okay? Famous brands they made were Skoll and Copenhagen Chewing Tobacco. So they also were making cigars and they'd gotten in the cigar business and they had brands like Don Tomas and Astral and Helix and other brands, but they decided to take their sales strategy. Instead of staying with tobacconists, they decided to go to all their wine distributors and uh, you know Southern Wine and Spirits and people like that. But once they did that, they destroyed the brand because the retailers basically blackballed the brand. But they had invested like over 80 to 100 million dollars in raw materials and tobacco. They had this giant factory that was state of the art down there. It was beautiful, and you know they were dead. There was nothing going on. But I knew they had all these aged wrappers. I knew that they had, because we would hang out, all of us, there was a small clique of people that would hang out in Honduras at the time. So I knew the, the type of tobaccos that they had over there. So, you know, I approached them and I said, listen, I'd like to buy all this Sumatra wrapper that you have that's aged for 10 years. And I also see that you have broadleaf that you grow in Telanga that's got 12 years of age on it. And they're like, oh no, we can't sell it, but 
you know, here's what we'll do. If you make the cigars with us, we'll let you have all that wrapper. And we also have some fillers that are seven years old, some Dominican Olor and Piloto. We also have some uh, seven and eight year old Nicaraguan from Esteli and from, you know, Jalapa. And so I went there and I started making blends and I got to know all the guys and I made 123 blends, 124 blends. Well, believe it or not, the first blend I made is the one that we ended up picking, that I ended up picking, that eventually became the vintage 1990. So that was the vintage. And I said to them, well, you know, the only way I'm gonna make the cigar here is if you let me do the same thing that we're doing over at the Posencia factory, which is have my own factory within your factory. So I had two places now making these cigars. So when we were capable of doing that, that's when we decided. And by then I had just bought out my partner, Phil. And uh, so now I was fully in charge of everything. We had decided to move to Florida. I'd given up the law practice. I was deep into this. At that time, after moving here, we decided to name the cigars, get rid of Indian tobacco and put my name on it because I felt proud that it's finally got the quality, it's got the consistency, it's got the construction, it's got the age, it's got the blends I want. And that's when we launched the Vintage 1990 with the Rocky Patel name. And that's how it started.